Hey guys, how you doing? It's James Dana, Heat Dana Real Estate. Uh, we have some few, a few more people kind of logging on, so we're going to delay the start time for just a couple minutes, and then we'll get going. Um, thanks for your patience. And thanks for everyone's patience. Uh, we're going to get going now that a few more people just kind of logged on. Um, just so everyone is aware, if you do jump in late at any time or you have to get off, uh, we do load these to a key under the media blog um, tab on our website. So feel free to, you can download and listen to it anytime or if you have some friends that want to listen to it as well, feel free to send it out. Um, but we're going to get this going. This is our final wrap up uh, for our four part series on Construction 101. Uh, we're we're going to break until. Uh, uh, January 1st, but we are going to be doing one webinar in the middle of December, uh, doing a 2018 recap of the market and our forecast for 2019 and how we think people should be purchasing and anticipating for any kind of market correction. Uh, so look forward, uh, look for that invite. Uh, it's going to be in the middle of December. We'll give you kind of our rundown and how we're buying things as an investor. Um, so uh, just to get started, a quick bio about me. Uh, for those who have not attended any of the other webinars or listened yet, uh, my name is James Daynard. Um, I've been a re uh, active real estate investor since 2006. Uh, I have flipped over 500 homes in King, Pearson, Snoh uh, Snohomish County. Uh, and uh, over the last 12 years, we have been in every market, uh, flipping homes in a flat market, uh, an appreciated market, and kind of a more stabilized market. So I have lots of different experience uh, with buying and selling homes. And as a broker, our team has designed and helped investors sell over 1,300 flipped listings um, since we founded. So we're one of the highest volume brokerage teams in the state that will help you get your assets sold if uh, it's ready for market. Uh, so what we've covered so far, 
uh, on our four-part series is in part one, we, we cover what to look for in your initial walkthrough, how to evaluate your findings, uh, what to prepare before you hire a contract, and then preparing your budget. And then part two, we went over finalizing your budget, hiring your contractor to bid the project, uh, budget tips and tricks uh, from myself and the ones I use on a daily basis, and then what contracts and forms we recommend people to use, and those are the same contracts and forms that I use. Again, any kind of contract or forms, please contact your legal advice uh, or your legal, uh, your attorney for legal advice. Um, and in part three, we covered change orders, uh, more tips and tricks on how to minimize those when they change your scope of work, punching out your house, and then contractor final payments. Um, again, all three of these are on our website. You can download them at any time. So what you're going to learn on this this last one is uh, what we're going to talk about is getting your asset ready to sell and how to make sure that that's the first thing that uh, comes off the market, <clears throat> you know, as inventory has increased, uh, you know, and we're still at half of what a normal market is. So, you know, typically a normal amount of inventory is five to six months. Currently, we're around three and a half months. So, you know, despite what the news is saying, the Seattle real estate market is actually relatively strong. Um, but what we want our clients to do, we've been kind of pitching them, is making sure once you get that buyer that you don't lose them because it could take a little bit more time to get that buyer back on the hook. The market has definitely changed as far as market times and uh, amount of buyers. So just make sure that your asset is the first one that gets sold on the market. So what we're going to talk about today uh, to kind of prevent any kind of sales blowing up or help get your home sold is the pro and cons of pre-inspecting your home. Um, items to look for before you actually list it. Because, again, you don't want to be walking away from your house because of an uh, unfinished list. Uh, neg uh, negotiating your 35R, and a 35R is a form uh, that's used by North Carolina's inspection response. And then uh, one thing that we just threw in at the very end, because I've got a lot of emails and requests comments about how do you break up with your contractor. If you hire a deadbeat or if your good contractor runs into final uh, into uh, financial issues, how do you get rid of them, and how do you move your project forward with the minimal uh, amount of loss in there? And then questions and answers immediately following. Um, and you guys, during this time, uh, at any time, feel free to type in those questions in that box, and they can log in, and we'll get to them at the very end. But if you have questions, feel free to write them throughout the, the presentation as well. So inspection items and 35 Rs. So one thing that we have been telling all of our clients, and I've been doing myself on every one of my listings, is pre-inspecting my asset before it lists. You know, again, as the market and inventory has increased, one thing I definitely don't want is a buyer getting the contract with the buyer, getting to my inspection, and for them to walk away because they, I left a way too big of a laundry list for their inspector to kind of go after. Um, un, un, too big of a laundry, laundry list or unfinished items, it, it makes it look like the seller doesn't care. And then when the, the inspector uh, starts nickeling and diming and picking the house apart, that's what your buyer's feeling at that time. And, you know, eight months ago, buyers were willing to take on a little bit of work because of lack of inventory. Now they're, they're willing to just move on to the next house. So it's very, very important that you have these houses buttoned up before you go to sell them or have your price reflect, you know, a home that needs a little bit of extra work in them. You know, if your house isn't turnkey, then price it accordingly. So uh, pros for for pre-inspecting home, the reason I do it is because I reduce closing issues and renegotiating. For me, it's way easier negotiating with people up front than trying to negotiate an inspection list after the fact. Um, a lot of times, brokers and buyers will bring in their own contractor bids, and the bids will be extremely high, which will kind of freak them out in the sale. So what we like to do is, you know, the big pro of this is to get it pre-inspected and then have my trades people come button up the list so it doesn't cost a ton of money later. Um, it's a, it's a again the pro is to control your cost because if I'm bringing in my my own crews my own team in here, I'm gonna know exactly what that's gonna cost me. Whereas they might bring in a little bit higher professional crew that you know or the set up more for retail contracting that can cost me five times the amount. And you know depending on what the inspector says, they might be very very adamant that I choose that specific trade per person, which I think they do. So by me buttoning up my house up front, it reduces my cost too as I'm negotiating. Um, also, what it's going to do is it's going to reduce my holding times on a property because, again, if buyers are coming into a house that's somewhat not finished, it's going to nitpick it and kind of move on. Or, you know, if I go on market and it takes me 30 days to get pending and then I waste two weeks getting into my inspection just for a laundry list 
to kind of come together and the buyer to walk away, that cost me two to three weeks, plus I have to go get all those items repaired. So it can cost me up to a month of time, which can be extremely expensive when you're in hard money or any kind of a more expensive takedown financing. And then also, uh, you know, things that I like to do uh, is a punch-out inspection rather than a full inspection. It gives you a little bit uh, cleaner list. It's simpler. It doesn't freak the buyer out, and give, it shows the buyer that you went to the trouble of hiring an inspector to give you a separate punch list to kind of make sure that they're getting a good home. And at the end of the day, buyers really just want to know that they're moving in a home that has had good take, uh, good, uh, it has good bones, has been well taken care of, or they want something cheap with value, right? But they, they're not, they're they're not going to get both. So uh, make sure the, the homes look good uh, before listing. So uh, cons to pre-inspecting. Some reasons why a lot of investors don't like to pre-inspect their home first. If they don't want to know, maybe they didn't know of a problem, their contractor didn't see a problem, and maybe they didn't want to be made aware of it because as a, as a seller, you don't need to make, you don't, it's not your responsibility to make every repair in the home. It is your responsibility to disclose any kind of repair that's not done or uh, to fix that issue. But as a seller and as an investor, you don't have to fix everything. Um, so some reasons why people don't want that list is they might be done with their projects and the home inspector calls something that may be simple and they don't want to fix it, but they need to disclose it then. Um, and then also when you hire for a pre-inspector, you want to make sure that they how you want to know the guy and how they phrase items. If you're doing a punch list and a pre-inspection, you don't want the guy coming in with very vague terms that can freak a potential buyer out. You want them to give you a punch out inspection with very specific items that you can address. You know, home inspectors naturally like to speak in kind of a vague um, description of things because they're trying to cover their own liability. So don't get trapped in that. Uh, just make sure they're, they're, they give you an exact list and how to uh, remediate the list. Um, another con is what our clients don't like um, and why they don't do it. Sometimes they, uh, when they go to a sale and then they get the inspection report after the buyer had walked away, they have to update all their dis seller disclosure statements. If you have a problem, you have to disclose it on your statement. So some investors just don't want to know about the problems because they're selling a home with no warranty behind it. Um, and then another con is just a liability. That liability is you're being disclosed of all information wrong with the house. It is your responsibility to fix those items if you know about the problems. Uh, personally, as an investor, I need I always make sure I take care of every issue that I can that I know about prior to listing my home, or I at least disclose it on my Form 17. Um, so those are the pros and cons of, of pre-inspecting home. Again, you guys, I've been pre-inspecting home, uh, all of my homes, especially in the last six months, because I want to make sure that my home is the most marketable home for sale. Also, um, things that we offer, they kind of help back, uh, piggyback the pre-inspection is we actually, uh, with any of our clients that list properties with them are, as brokers, we pay for a home warranty for, um, the, the potential buyers to make sure they know that they're buying a quality asset. Um, so things that we tell our clients and we check for on everything um, we check for before listing one of our homes is, uh, you know, we make kind of a, a general list of things that can kind of actually create a bunch of red flags for the home inspectors that are coming through. Um, one thing is thermostats and hot water. If a home inspector, if your hot water is not on or the hot water tank's not turned on, if they can't test the water, they have to come back and reinspect, which is a fee trip. It causes more time. Um, they can't do their full inspection. A lot of times the home inspectors get annoyed, so they kind of get, they make it sound a little bit worse than it is. So just make sure all your hot water is on and working. Also make sure your thermostats are working. Make sure your heater's not running too hot and it's not running too cold or not at all. It's just going to cause a work order and an additional inspection that can cost you money. Um, you know, if it's not working correctly, for example, a lot of what comes up is we'll install a brand new furnace and the home inspector, because it wasn't turned on, will say, uh, have mechanical inspected by a certified uh, uh, HVAC uh, professional and service and clean the furnace. We don't need to service and clean a furnace because it's brand new. So uh, that would be a waste of $300. So just make sure all your stuff's working and it will prevent you from additional receipts and bills later. Um, water pressure and flushing toilets. Uh, a lot of times plumbers will turn off the water as they're kind of finishing things up and they don't turn it back on. So just make sure all your water is flushing. Home inspectors won't turn on water for liability purposes. So again, you just want them to make sure uh, that they can get their home inspection done in one shot. Uh, water pressure. 
make uh, check to make sure your plumber didn't turn up the water pressure too high or too low. Um, you know, if you're selling any kind of older home, it can actually red flag it for older plumbing, which then the buyer might ask for all new plumbing in your home when it might not be necessary. Um, it might just be as simple as turning down a valve or turning up a valve. So make sure your water pressure is good and working uh, because it will just prevent a big negotiation for later and possibly replumbing the home. Um, uh, piggybacking on the thermo, uh, thermostat to hot water, make sure your, your furnace is clean to service always. You know, if you did install a new one and they've still been working on it, swap out the filters. It costs 50 bucks. Um, it'll make it look like you, you took the time to care. Plus, when you turn on your heat later, it won't blow dust throughout your home. You don't want a brand new, nice, clean home uh, kind of getting dirtied up. Uh, the other thing, check your attics and crawl space. You guys, insulation for your attics is not very expensive. You can go buy, a, if you buy five bags of insulation, Home Depot will give you the um, blower for free. That's a cost of 600 bucks to throw in insulation in your attic a lot of times. If your attic's not cleaned out, you know, most of the time buyers are naturally going to go to companies like Clean Crawls or kind of the bigger institutional companies. Those companies are very expensive. They will charge you four to five times more than what a normal contractor will, will, will uh, go to, but they're going to give a very detailed report with overkill because they're trying to sell their services that could cost you a lot later. So just by checking your crawls and attics, you'll cut your cost down by 65%, whether if a buyer brings in a professional company. Uh, make sure your appliances are on and working. Uh, earth, earth to wood contact. Inspectors love calling this out. It's very simple. Just pull your earth away from your wood. Um, uh, deck support is another big one. This can cost a lot of money with, you know, if you're uh, just by, you know, buyers come in, they see, you know, possibly a lot of us buy homes that have decks that are older. Uh, um, you know, they've been installed, you'd say, 10 years ago with maybe different building code. And when an inspector comes through, they quote new building code. And all it does is confuse the buyer to, enough to where they want to get the deck up to brand new code, even though it's not a brand new deck. So just make sure that you have all your lag bolts in. There's all sorts of supporting, uh, you know, clips, hurricane straps, just preventative things. You know, bolts and hurricane straps and clips, that's like $500 to $800 in extra items that would that could possibly save you four grand down the road if a, a home inspector throws out an opinion that he might not think it's supported right. You really got to watch this because home inspectors love to say, verify with a structural engineer but this looks like it might not be up to code and then all that does is create doubt in your buyer's mind so again taking care of the little items will prevent that later uh, moisture readings you know check to make sure that you don't have any kind of moisture reading a lot of times even our tile guys will run too much water it gets a little bit in the sheetrock and it's drying out but it will cause a moisture reading and then they all of a sudden want us to investigate all the drainage in the house which can be a very very expensive item um, light bulbs and switches make sure those are always working so they don't uh, come up with an electrical issue possibly, and then you got to bring an electrician out there. Um, sign, uh, I always make sure that I have my signed off inspection card on the counter. The reason I like doing that is because the first thing home inspectors look for if it's a flip home is whether it was permitted or not. And then after it's been permitted or it has been permitted, they're going to have a preconceived notion of it a lot of times. If it hasn't been permitted, they think they kind of slapped it together. If they saw that all the permits were signed off, the city inspector has gone to the work and they're a little bit less picky. Uh, and then the other thing is, guys, make sure your gators and downspouts are cleaned out. They're pointed away from the house. And put a splash box on them because a lot of times, you guys, code is putting a splash box and routing the water away where the home inspector will recommend hard pipe your pipes away. That's not necessary on every house. Uh, what building code says is they just need to be routed away. So, uh, you know, splash blocks cost 100 bucks. Routing your drain lines into a French drain uh, into your yard or a splash that drain can run you up to four grand. So just put in the $100 in items that it could prevent you an issue later. All right, so once you have your house all punched out and it gets to market and you get that offer, we're going to talk about uh, 35R negotiations, okay? So what we've seen a lot of times, and on my own home, is the home inspector or the broker will just attach a whole inspection list and send it over to us. So the list on their inspection looks extremely long, and my first knee-jerk reaction as an investor is like, I don't want to do this work. But what I always need to do is review the full scope of work and then pull my contractor bid in pull their scope of work. Because 70% of the time, it's warranty work. 
So 70% of this huge list that they sent it is on the contractor, and I've already paid the contractor, so it's not going to cost them anything. So at that point, I'm just taking care of a potential buyer down the road. And, you know, so what I then do is once I pull out these items, the 70% that's already been warrantied, I then focus on the 30% and figure out whether it's safety issues, whether it's common for homes of that year built. You know, a lot of times I hear people say, hey, uh, the concrete stairs are, are settling in Seattle. Uh, you know, it's a 1920s house and the entry steps are settling an inch. That's normal. H homes that are 100 years old that have concrete that's heavy and it's 100 years old, they sink, they settle. Um, you know, so that's going to be something that I'll push back on because it's not going to cost me anything because A, it's normal for the area. And then B, uh, it's not warranty work. So it's a cost item. So again, first thing you want to do is pull out the list then figure out what's covered and what's not covered and then create the list of what's going to, uh, what items uh, that are going to cost you money and then work it with your broker on trying to negotiate out those items. Um, one thing that we always tell our clients, and we're going to go over an example of this in just a couple slides, is ensure your verbiage on your 35R is not vague and open-ended. That's very, very important as we go into these houses because a lot of times a broker will say just, you know, they'll send us an inspection response and say, do the whole inspection report. Or make sure home is, you know, inspect crawl space and make sure it is in good, working, safe condition. Those are vague answers. What we want is a specific item that they want fixed with a specific answer. Um, vague will allow, uh, kind of open you up for liability later that, you know, it can be kind of interpreted by a court rather than a specific detail. Um, and so it will, it just really reduces your liability going down with very, very straight uh, and clear 35R forms. Um, attention to details, agree to specifics. I, knew, I just touched on that. Make sure everything is specifically listed out. Um, and then what I like to do as I'm negotiating things, I have the proposed work orders. Uh, my contractors start to bid these items. So if I know I have uh, 48 hours to get back on my inspection response, as soon as I get that initial list, I'm going to take out the warranty items and look at the cost items and safety items. I know I'm going to probably take care of the safety items unless we can negotiate out of them. I'm taking care of the safety items. I immediately get my guys to go start bidding the work so then I can figure out what other items I can cut off. Because, again, it does come down to dollars and cents and, and making sure you're making a return. So you don't want to agree or over, or, you know, agree to too little and they walk away or agree to too much and you waste your return. Um, and then what I like to do is as I'm getting these bids, offer credit to the buyer. If I don't have to do that work, it prevents a way smoother closing because, Dealing with contractors and their schedules and their efficiencies can cause a lot of headaches in a, in a project. You know, buyers and brokers can get very upset when construction schedules shift, which as investors, we're used to that happening, but they're not. So, uh, you know, try to get them to agree their credit over doing the work, unless the credit is just extremely high um, and you can get it done for substantially cheaper. Um, and, you know, a tip that we wanted to point out on these negotiations, because right now I think everyone's in a transition to where, you know, a lot of times we could push back on almost all the inspection items because, you know, there was literally a half month worth of inventory in the market. You know, now with choices, you don't want the buyer walking away because, the, you know, our tip to everybody is don't lose your first buyer because many of the times that's going to be your highest net offer. Um, you know, they're going to give you the highest offer. They may be difficult on their, their inspection, and that's why pre-inspecting and, and doing your punch out is really going to help with that. Um, but I would say 90% of the time, that's going to get you your highest net offer. Um, and, you know, the reason also we talk about that is because there's always other financial impacts that happen from losing a buyer. You know, you know, we've all been in that seat where the buyer's asking for too many things and it financially doesn't quite make sense. But at the end of the day, I also have to bring these items into my decision making. Other impacts that I always got to look at is what's the market activity in the on market? Now, right now, we were used to everything selling in seven to 10 days. And now, you know, the market time is really two, you know, three to five weeks, depending on the neighborhood. If I lose that buyer, it could be another five weeks of holding time until I generate the next buyer, because that's what the market trend is. That's a month and a half of hard money payments. So I always need to calculate what that expense is. Not only do I have hard money expenses, I have utility costs. You know, that's another... Uh, you know, 300 bucks. I have staging costs, whether that's going to expire. Uh, you know, I have to take care of the yard. 
uh, all those things can start to really add up. And, you know, an inspection item, maybe, you know, the furnace was nine years old and they wanted a brand new one, which is probably a little ridiculous, but the cost of $2,500 on a new furnace might be way less than the, the hard money cost in the holding times. Um, and then also just really always ask yourself, is that next buyer going to ask for that anyways? If they're buying a flipped house and they're, they're paying kind of peak pricing or the market pricing, they might want everything new anyways. So really ask yourself if the next buyer is going to want it that way or not um, and kind of go with those financial impacts. Um, one thing we want to put out, and sorry guys, this didn't quite transition well. You know what we might have to do is put this on as an attachment so you guys can read it. Um, we're going to put it on as an attachment so you can read it. So what we did, guys, is we actually had a, a very recent 35R um, that was very, very vague in general uh, when they wrote it up. And so, you know, what we wanted to show an example of is how we cleaned it up. Um, you know, our initially we came across as very vague and very open-ended, but because we knew that first buyer was so important, we wanted to make sure we got the deal stuck together. Um, and, you know, part of that was just making sure that everything was very clearly defined. Um, when you get the download attachments, you'll see the whole um, inspection response and rewriting it into this form, which is very, very clear and very concise. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to actually add these as a, uh, details so you guys can kind of look at the examples. And then feel free to ask any questions uh, about the examples. Reach out and email me uh, about questions of why we did things and change things around and kind of go through. But, um, what you will see on the screen is very detailed. Uh, besides, you can't, it's not legible right now. But uh, we know exactly what we needed to do. And then the client had a very detailed list to give to his contractor that they could get an estimate on. Um, you know, prior to that, uh, I think they had some stuff in there that said, uh, remove all rot or any safety issue. Removing any safety issue or, uh, is not an actual fact, right? What, what they were actually asking for was to eliminate moisture intrusion, uh, clean up all the rot, replace it all with a, a licensed a, a bonded contractor and have a pest inspector come inspect it to make sure there was no other water intrusion or uh, you know possibility of, of uh, water damage. But that's not kind of how they asked for it. So what we did is we just cleaned it up and gave them very, very specific details to make sure there wasn't any issues. And actually we're, we're heading to closing on this one right now. Um, they're wrapping up the repairs right now and we haven't had any issues, which has been good because the last thing we want in this market is some issues. All right, so some trips and uh, tips and tricks for you guys to make sure that you have a smooth sale going on. So again, the first thing you want to tell people is again, put your permits on your counter. Show the if you have them, if show the buyer and their inspector that you went through the local cities and jurisdictions and got your work inspected or your contractor's work inspected. That automatically takes them down a notch before they start asking for things. Um, you know, I know when I sell homes, I don't sell them with any kind of warranty behind them, uh, but I will print out warranties that are uh, applicable, which is, you know, like my appliances have a one-year warranty through Ferguson's, so I give them that warranty. My roofer has a, you know, a workmanship uh, warranty, so I give them that warranty. Um, anything outside of things that are written warranty from the company that are transferable, I don't offer anything, but just put the warranties out there that they are offered. Um, because I don't offer a warranty uh, for my tradesmen, because they're not my tradesmen, they're their own company. Um, what we do uh, have is we, with Fidelity National Title, we offer a home warranty. Uh, it costs 350 bucks, and it, it makes the buyer at ease. That any if any appliances or anything break down, that they'll be covered in there. Um, so uh, you know, it kind of puts them at ease for for knowing that they'll get some sort of warranty out of it. Again, if you want to list the property with us, we'll pay for the warranty. So uh, look us up. We'll help sell your home. And then uh, I always like to put a list of upgrades. So the reason I like to put a list of upgrades is A, to help market the property and sell it. But then also when the inspector gets there, he can see what you actually did as work. Because a lot of times if an investor leaves something like old wiring, it's because they didn't have any intention of doing the old, uh, replacing the old wiring. You know, the comparable data that they might have been using had old, old wiring, or maybe it had old galvanized plumbing or had aluminum windows. So it's just really, you know, and we price based on upgrades and uh, condition at home. 
so just it's important that the home inspector knows what you did to the home uh, because you don't have to upgrade the whole home to sell it. Um, that is not required. And, you know, when a buyer buys it, a lot of times people are buying stuff with a few issues on them um, if they're priced accordingly. Uh, and then I always have my signed off punch list there because I like to do that because it shows the buyer and the inspector that I took the time to punch up the house. And then also with my pre-inspection, because I have all my homes pre-inspected, I leave that out with, uh, and then I make my contractors and my project managers initial each item when they've been completed in the date so that the buyer and the inspector can see that we took care of the item. Um, again, these are all things that show a buyer that you're, you're taking time and care on your, on your project. And, um, you know, it will really help you with your closings going forward. All right. So now that we talked about punching out your house and making sure your sale doesn't blow up, we're going to talk about permitting because uh, this was actually something that was highly requested as well um, from our clients. So we want to make sure we address this. Um, you know, we kind of wanted to just do a general permit overview in, in general. Uh, one thing I want to say is you guys, every city, every jurisdiction is different. They all have their own rules. They all do a little bit different. Um, you know, some are better to work with some than, than others, from my own personal opinion. Um, and if you have specific questions on jurisdictions, reach out to your listing brokers and they can get you some answers. We do have a full plan and permit guy that works with one of our sister companies that can help answer some of those questions too. Um, so generally, when do you get permits? I get permits on every project. Um, you know, and that's kind of what I recommend to all clients and all of our budget sheets. We always put a cost in there for permits. Um, you know, just at least a anticipated cost. Uh, you know, I think if you're going to sell this, your asset, in, you know, any kind of market that has inventory in it, you want to make sure that you're not giving buyers objections. Having permits on your house will make them, it will put them at ease. And also it's going to make your asset look way better than any of the other flip properties out there that aren't permitted because they're getting more quality, they're getting quality of work and verification of safety. So in my opinion, you always get permits. Things that I always push on our clients is make sure if you're going to not permit certain things, get your electricals and plumbing permits. Those are safety issues. Always get those done. Um, and you guys, honestly, if L and I gets involved in your project, it's not fun. It's not worth the hassle. Get your permits, get them inspected. Um, how to budget for timeline to, to get the permits. Um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a question, uh, a tough question that we wanted to put in here. The reason we wanted to put that in is there's a lot of variance in variables in that. Um, it really depends on your scope of work and what you want to do to the project, and then also what city you're working in. Um, that's why it's really important to work with a really good brokerage team or an investment team and kind of guide you through this. Uh, like, for example, part of our training at our office is permits and timelines in different cities. So I know that if I'm in city of Seattle, I can get an over-the-counter permit if I'm doing even if I'm doing electrical and plumbing, but I'm not taking drywall off the wall and I'm doing it a certain way, I can get that over the counter. Or if I am taking all the drywall off the wall and I'm not totally rearranging the whole thing, I can get into a secondary plan review or a streamlined plan review to where I can get my permits in two to three weeks. But I have to have engineering and a floor plan that goes along with it. Or if I know I'm going to be a full studs down rebuild of a whole house, it's going to take me three to four months in my permit. So based on my end value, and my scope to work, I'm in a budget for that. And really what that comes down to is working with a good team that can give you good advice on how to navigate that. Uh, I always permit old systems. You know, I'm a big component or uh, I'm, I'm very big on updating homes to current uh, construction code um, in the city just when I go to sell them. Uh, you know, old systems, you guys, people don't want to buy something just for it to break later down the road. Um, you know, old wiring could be a fire hazard. No one wants to hear that in their, their inspection. Old plumbing that they might have to replumb their whole house. You know, for a normal homeowner, that might cost them 25 to 30 grand and it might only cost us eight. So a lot of times it's worth putting these items in because it just saves you down the road. Um, what can I do while you wait for permits? So this, anytime I'm buying in a city, I, the first thing as I identify a project is what can I start on immediately? So for example, we have a project in Seattle right now where we're in streamlined plan review, we're waiting for engineering, but during that time we've demoed the, uh, we've got we got a demo permit, we demoed the structure, or we got our asbestos removal, we had the home abated, and then we had the home the the demo items uh, already demoed out of the house. Uh, we got a roof permit to get the roof on, and so as we're waiting for this streamlined review, we're knocking things off our list. 
So right now we're, we should have a permit in about seven days. And when we have our permit, the, the home will already be abated, demoed, roofed, all the landscaping's been cleaned up, and then our floor plans have been finalized and all our bids are, are being uh, or completed, so our, our budget is finalized. So there's a lot of stuff you can do while you're waiting for permits. Waiting for permits isn't the end of the world. Um, and then uh, what does your scope of work call for when you're applying for your permits? So you guys, if whatever value you put on the end of your asset, that's what your permit needs to match. So if you're doing a Craftsman home in Seattle that has all plaster and nice cove ceilings, and you're just updating the existing floor plan, then that's what you need to permit in. You know, a lot of times our clients will say, oh, I'm doing a, a renovation on this house. I'm going to flip it and make it really nice. And then they get thrown into plan or view. Whereas if they really just went through the detail of what the comparable property uh, was stating to do, they could have got a permit over the counter. So it's really important to know exactly what the scope of work is that you're doing and don't over embellish it. The city doesn't want to hear about how nice you're going to make this project. They want to know the facts and that you're going in and you're not doing structural, you are doing structural, and then what you need to do to get that permit. Um, and then, like, kind of piggybacking on that, description work is very important. Make sure you don't over tell answers. You know, people will go into the permit counter to start throwing up all over the permit text, and it just gets them thrown in a plan interview. You know, what are you doing at the house? Is it, uh, you know, are you moving structure? Are you adding square footage? Are you not adding square footage? All these things come into play with how fast you can get your permit. And then it's also how you ask for it. You guys, um, when, you know, personally, we go in and we have our own employees get the permits because we don't want our contractor going in to ask for the permit because we're going to ask for it in a very polite, nice way, whereas they might come in in a rush and disorganize and then that gets thrown into plan interview. So how you deliver that message to that permit tech is almost as important as the description of work. So just go in there, be nice, be cordial, but also stick to the facts, and then they, it will help streamline your permit. Um, if you need any help on this, just please reach your broker, and we can kind of give you some, some tips for how to get things permitted as well. Um, so uh, as you go get your your permits, uh, one thing that we, we want to kind of touch on is the scope of work evaluation. So again, what what I just touched on was knowing exactly what your comparable data is telling you to do. So if I'm in a uh, 1920s house in Seattle, and I'm you know I have a target list price of 9.99, what does that 9.99 house house have? It might not have a wide open kitchen. It might only have one bathroom on the main floor. Or maybe they do have an additional bathroom, but it's non-structural, not moving. Because if I know that comparable data really well, really, what I need to do, I can minimize the scope of work and what I need to do to, at the permit city, which will get me my permit faster. Now, if my my uh, comparable is saying, hey, I'm going to sell for one five, and I need to put dormers in and blow open the whole main floor and leasing the whole house, then I just need to plan for a long permit time because that's going to be a three to four month permit. So just, again, knowing my comparable data for what I'm going to sell the property for helps me with my budgeting and then getting my permit. And then also in your comparable uh, data, see what systems they have. You know, if the home has an oil furnace, you know, if you're comparable at 999, has an oil furnace and you have an oil furnace that works, leave the furnace plus it gets you out of a mechanical permit. So really know what you need to permit and not permit. And your comparable data is always going to tell you that along with your building um, requirements um, and every city is different when it comes to building requirements you have to go in you have to talk to them I personally know every city pretty well so if you have any questions feel free to reach out and ask us and we'll get back to you on it or uh, contact your listing broker it's all part of our listing services we'll kind of help you coach you, uh, you through that um, and then you know by knowing your scope of work and your evaluation you're gonna be able to plan accordingly for all your cost expense so just really again guys before you make your budget, know what you're really trying to achieve. I see a lot of investors go right past this, and it causes them a lot of delays and a lot of expensive items. All right, now that we've gone through permits, we are going to, and this is our last little session, and we're going to open up for questions and answers. We are going to talk about the most persistent question that I've gotten in the last month, and that's how do you bump up against the contractor when you're passing your papers? Um, and this is not an easy thing to do, guys, um, because a lot of times before you make this decision you need to do this, the guy has already cost you a ton of money. And by that, you know, what we always tell our clients, and I have to come to terms with numerous times, is 
don't hang on to someone too long because the damages are going to are going to amount to a huge number. You know, if you recognize problems, then just, you know, move on pretty quickly from the person, but try to minimize the loss. So, you know, this is, uh, I'm going to talk about my process on how I handle this. Again, this is just my process. I'm not saying this is the right way or the wrong way. Uh, consult your attorney for legal advice and how you want to do that, especially if you drafted your construction contract. But what my process is, as soon as, um, as, soon as I uh, start noticing financial signs from a contractor of problems, I I start kind of looking at phasing them out. You know, financial problems, what that, that's going to be kind of linked to is, you know, if they're asking for their progress payments too soon, if they want too big of a down payment check, um, talk to their subcontractors, get to know them, find out they're getting paid. You know, a lot of times they're subcontractors because I've built such a good relationship with them over the years. They'll call me and tell me if they haven't been paid or not. Um, you know, so just look for those financial signs. Those are the first things. If people are asking for too big of checks or too fast checks, that's the biggest sign you have. Um, and then check to see what their construction benchmarks are missed. You know, if they're, you give them a down payment check and they're demoing and they're supposed to be down in a week and they're at two weeks, that's a bad first sign. So check your benchmarks, make sure you really establish those in your construction contract and then find out what the root of the problem is on getting your benchmarks. Um, and then you'll hear a lot of excuses when your projects are delaying. Another sign is if subs aren't showing up. They like to blame everybody else first. Oh, this guy didn't show up. This guy didn't show up. If they tell me that, I actually ask for their info and I call them and see what the deal is. Because if that's a true fact and they didn't show up, it's not their fault. But if they just never called them or the guy has been waiting on money, I kind of want to know that so I can prepare myself on, on how to exit the agreement with the contractor. Um, and then – as I start recognizing these signs, the first thing I do is, or after that, is I calculate what work's been completed and what I paid them already. Um, you know, so if I've given my check for $15,000 down, I'm going to go through their bid and calculate exactly what work they've completed so far. So I know exactly what the damage amount is. Um, and then what I do, depending on what the difference is, so let's say I give the contractor $15,000 and they've done $7,000 in work. You know, my goal is to get the 15000 back, which might not happen just because they're having financial problems. So then what I do is I go through what the remaining scope of work is on the house, and I pick out the items that are the most expensive sub-items for me to bring in. For example, it windows to, you know, windows are actually not very expensive. You know, the cost of a window, a lot of times you can get them at, you know, on average $130, $160 per window at, at Home Depot or Lowe's. That's not even a, like a builder cost. So the install when these guys are charging three fifty to four hundred is extremely high, two hundred and fifty dollars per window or three hundred dollars or more per window. So a lot of times what I'll do is I if I see a contract having issues, I'll say, Hey, I, it looks like you might be having a little bit of money issues. What if I just buy the windows and get those installed right away? Then I can help get you a progress payment check. It once we get caught up. And so I start getting them to do work so I can reduce my sub cost in that way and I always have them focus on those items. Uh for example, I got a contractor right now that he ran out of money. I already paid him for two decks. He has no money to buy the materials on the decks. So I got him to agree to install the decks if I buy the materials and then I'm letting him off the hook because it's easier for me to let him off the hook and eat the couple thousand bucks in labor than to go pay $8,000 for two new decks. So, uh, you know, it's really just figuring out what the best possible solution is for there. Um, and honestly, if the guy doesn't show up to have create the decks, then I'll just go hire someone to, to finish them because I can't have him drag out my project any longer. Um, and again, like I just said, purchase supplies to install, you know, if guys are having problems, don't give them more money to go buy things. Make sure you're, if you're, you're doing a structured removal of the contractor to get them to do work, buy the materials yourself, keep them in a safe place, keep them on site, make sure that they don't have access to take them away with them. And then once you've done all these things, you know, and you need to separate, there's a process that you have to follow. A lot of or at least from what I've been advised to do um, for my lawyer is to follow this process. A lot of people think, well, they just didn't show up. They they violated the contract. I'm just going to fire them and move someone on. That isn't technically wrong, but it can open you up for a ton of different liens. You know, that contractor can say they're owed money, even if they're way ahead of you on the scale. So what you want to do is to eliminate any kind of problem with your sale later down is uh, when I start separating my contractor, I document all faulty work that's been done. And then I have my attorney send out a legal letter stating separation of business and breach of contract. 
and then we have we actually post a notice at the door saying do not enter. Okay, the, the, that letter is very very important because you're now notifying them that they are breach contracts and we do not want them to come back to the property. It sets a precedent to where they won't lean it later, or if they do, you you followed all the kind of notices. Um, and then after I send that letter, I actually send a separate letter to show them we're not playing around, itemizing all the stated list of damages and that we want to mitigate the damages with them. Okay, the worst case scenario, maybe I pick up some work, or worst case scenario, we just don't have any money and they disappear. Uh, if that's the case, you can take it to court and file a lawsuit against them and go for something for, called a default judgment, where if they're not usually showing up to the job, they don't show up to court, and you'll get damages awarded to you. It's very hard to get the damages back. Um, but at the end of the day, if you have any kind of dispute with the contractor, it might be a little bit off. Just you want to get the letters out to them, stating what's going on, and then also mitigating the damages. Maybe he can come back, do some work for you, or give you some money back. That's ideally what you want. Or sometimes the guy's in such a disaster, you just want him to disappear. And that's also what the letters will help do. It's just getting them off the job site to prevent further damages. So, again, if you have any questions about this, feel free to reach out. We can kind of give you some advice. I know it's a bad situation to, to be in. Um, currently in a couple right now, it's just a constant thing of being an investor. Uh, you know, um, and if you want more advice on how to prevent this, uh, go to the webinar number two, and it has all the contracts in there and how to set up your construction to where this won't happen down the road or help prevent things down the road to kind of mitigate your losses. But you guys, it's a really big problem. Uh, if for some reason you've been ripped off by a contractor lately, you're not by yourself. It happens to everybody. Um, just reach out to the investment community or us and let us know your questions, and we're here to, here to help. Um, so now that we've wrapped up our final construction 101 presentation, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Um, so uh, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to start firing them in your question box. Um, we're going to take this for the next 30 minutes. and. Um, We'll kind of go from there. If you guys have any questions, let me know. All right, so one of the questions we have is, um, do you have to disclose everything you find on a pre-inspection? Yes, you guys, uh, anything that you know about your house as a material fact needs to be disclosed in your Form 17. Um, it's just, That's very important, um, you guys, that covers your liability. It's honestly just the right thing to do. But yes, if you get a pre-inspection, either address the item or you do need to update your Form 17. Uh, another person asked for this 35 response uh, copies. Yeah, those guys are going to be um, posted on heatandgator.com, 35R, and loaded in so you guys can download those. Uh, Dale asked, uh, are, you, are you pulling permits for just uh, switches in? Uh, are you just, are you pulling permits if you're just switching out lights? Uh, plugs and switches. Uh, yes, we actually do pull an electrical trim out um, permit. You know, depending on you know, actually, some of, a lot of our clients don't because they are contractors and they're, they're they can do it themselves because they're homeowners. Uh, but yes, if I do anything electrical, I'm always just having an electrician do it. Uh, at, at minimum, I have a certified electrician do it, or I get a permit. Uh, one question is: Hi, James. Is there a recourse a homeowner could take against non-licensed contractors? As far as I know, no. Uh, you know, and honestly, if you make that claim, you're going to get fined for hiring a nine licensed contractor. It's kind of a joke on how they have that set up. But uh, if they're not licensed and bonded, they don't have a license to actually do the construction work. It's technically for how Washington reads it. Is it, and again, you guys consult your attorney uh, <clears throat> for the the most accurate answer on this. But uh, as far as I know, you can't do it because they're not a licensed tradesman anyways. That's a good question. I've had that same issue back in the day. Uh, 
uh, one of our clients asked if you do it yourself for the electrics and the trim out. You know, I'm not a hundred. I'm eighty. No, I'm saying ninety percent sure that if you do it yourself and that you're the homeowner, you're allowed to do that. But you should check out LNI's site. I don't want to misquote LNI. That's the last person I want to. I misquote, but check out their, their website at LNI, and they'll give you a list of things to do. But I'm pretty sure it's like when you do an electric panel. What I do know is if I uh, a lot of our clients are qualified and they've been in construction for a long time, they'll pull they own the home, they pull homeowner permit, uh, and they install their own electrical panel. Um, and so you're allowed to do that. So I think you you can do it on the trim out as well. Uh, another question is, what's your approach to handling contractors that won't return your call? <laughs> um, I can be a little bit crazy. So what I will do is I will just call them from different numbers over and over and over again. And I will always get them on uh, the phone. Uh, the other thing I like to do is pull up their contractor license and find out which job site, uh, permits they've pulled recently. And if they have a permit pulled out of site, I usually will stop by. If I can't get a hold of them and they have my money, I'll stop by the job site to talk to them. Um, you know, kind of freaks them out. And usually they get back to work pretty quickly or, or we work on getting my money back. So um, that's two ways you can kind of uh, kind of do that. Uh, the other thing is sending complaints. If someone took, takes your money and they're not responding to you, um, you know, call the Better Business Bureau, call l and I, and then, you know, a little additional pressure usually will get them to respond back. Uh, when completing a rewire on a property, do you uh, property do you remove drywall to rewire to keep the electric cost down? Uh, and if this is trigger uh, trigger longer permit time frame uh, requirements, uh, this is a very very good question. Uh, it depends on the city. So you know where I do a lot of my full rewires is in CDC. So you know what you can do if if there's two ways you can rewire a house really. Or two ways I do it. Either we take it down to the studs, all the drywall comes out, or it's a basement that already doesn't have drywall, and we rewire the whole thing. Um, you know, which is always going to cost me about, uh, you know, about three dollars per square foot to run that wire. Now, if I trench in the wires, it's a lot more work on the electrician. Um, also, it's a, it, caught, it it ends up being your your drywall repair can be as almost as much as drywall in general. Um, so it usually adds about 20% to my electrical cost for having them trench it in. But what it does do, and this is why this is a very good question, is it allows you to streamline your permit through the city of Seattle because a lot of times if you are just, you know, some of these 1950s homes are in really good shape, but they do have old wiring throughout it, and you might not be opening the walls and the plaster, or, you know, the drywall could be in really good shape or the plaster and the floor plan is really good, you know, it's a really good optimal floor plan. You just want to update it. And so trenching in wires is an over-the-counter remodel at that point because you're not removing all the plaster or adding square footage off the wall. So it can you literally can go from, depending on your scope of work and what you're doing, it can go from an over-the-counter permit to a three-month permit or you know a two-month, a two to three-month permit. So uh, that is something to consider on your scope of work. Uh, and that's kind of what we were talking about with our scope of work section is just really identify what you're doing and not doing. Um, and also identify what your comparable data says. If, again, if you're chasing a house that has all new drywall, all new trim, uh, been completely rebuilt, and that's the target price you are, then your over-the-counter permit, keeping your your dry or your plaster is not going to work. Um, but if most of your comparable data do have the plaster and people have worked around it, then by all means, keep it on the wall, save the budget, and get your permit faster. Next question is, how do you keep your contractors within your timelines for a project? Damages. Uh, that's the best way you can do it. Uh, you know, constantly babysitting the guys. Well, and what we do is we have a weekly site. With, uh, myself or a project manager will go meet them on site to go walk it with them, find out what, what they come for the week and then what they're, what's on the list for next week and what's on their schedule for that week. Um, and then in all of our, um, Every project I hire a contractor on, I put a damages clause in there. We agree to the time frame. Uh, it's got a clear written scope of work on how you adjust those time frames. And then uh, 
what the damages are. My damages are anywhere between 150 and 250 per day, depending on the size of my hard money loan. Um, but that usually will work. Um, and uh, if you, for the client to ask this, if you go onto our website and you download webinar number two, that talks about all of our setups on how we get the contractors to show up and put them in the contracts and, and rework it. So all that information is in there for you too. And also, I think copies of our construction contract are also on that webinar. Um, or you can email us and we can kind of send that out over to you with the damages clause in there. Uh, another question is, do you let your contractors do other jobs while working on your projects? Uh, I don't, uh, well, I, you know, it, it, our contractors can work for whoever they want. They're their own separate individual business. I can tell you one thing, if they're running late on things I, and I know they're working on other people's projects, I am not nice with my penalties. Uh, and they know that I'm pretty reasonable and very nice uh, until I think they're taking advantage of me. And if they're taking on additional work that's slowing down my job, then that's causing me damages, and they're going to pay for those. So we do let them do it. If they, if they slow us down, we get the old guys amount of volume. If they slow down because they're taking on additional work, I just cut them off the work, and then uh, they can they can work for other people at that point. Question: When getting bids for projects, do you uh, do you bring a plumber, electrician, and HVAC subs before or after the bid? Um, so that's a very good question. Uh, and that again, you guys, look at our other webinars. Uh, let me just plug it back so there's good information in there. Um, so how it, I think in webinar two it talks about estimating and preparing your budget. Um, so what I do. Uh, what typically we do, because I'm paying a plumber per square foot on my plumbing and per fixture and per, uh, per trenching, it's not going to matter um, whether it's before or after demo. Typically, I get my bids done while I'm waiting for my permits. So if I'm plumbing a house, it's a full replumb. I know what they should be charging me per square foot, how much trenching they need to do, how many fixture counts we have, what kind of fixtures, so whether they have drywall or not won't affect their bid. Uh, and so really that's just being prepared before you meet the contractors, whether the walls are open or not. Now, if it's a cosmetic remodel and you have more kind of questions, yes, it might be better to do it after demo uh, because it will reduce change orders. Um, but usually those plumbing bills are going to be a lot uh, less. So I guess the, the quick answer is if it's a full permitted, full replacement, uh, no, I don't need them whether it's demo or not beforehand. I get it before to speed things up. If it's a cosmetic deal, I'll bring in my plumber after all the demo's been done because usually it's, you know, it's a one-day to two-day job at most. All right, guys, we got about five more minutes. We started about five minutes late, so we're going to go into 7.05. Five more uh, uh, minutes for questions. Or you guys can keep asking them, I'll keep answering them. So when you guys run out of questions, I'll stop talking. Um, another question is, any tricks when the city asks you to do seismic retrofit? Just do it any way to avoid it. Um, if the city wants you to seismic upgrade the house, you're probably going to have to do it. Um, the, US, the cost on it actually isn't that expensive, uh, depending on, on what they're requiring you to do. Typically, what I see it cost me is about four grand total, which I guess can be you know, uh, you know, on those big studs out projects, it's about four percent of my budget. Um, you know, like it's two to four percent of the budget. But uh, if they're telling you seismic retrofit, you're going to have to do it. Uh, how you don't have to do the seismic retrofitting is if you don't take the drywall off the wall. So, uh, like one of our previous clients asked earlier, when you're going to get permits on your electrical. You know, if you have really good plaster throughout and you can salvage it, you can get away from seismic upgrading if you trench in all the wires. Yes, you'll pay more for your electrical, but it's going to speed everything up and prevent the seismic upgrades. And if it, you guys, if it's down to the studs, you're probably going to have to seismic upgrade it. Um, you know, it's just kind of the way that the city of Seattle is doing it. You don't need a lot of seismic upgrade retrofitting requirements from some of the other cities because a lot of the homes are built in 1950 or 60. So most of that comes from the city of Seattle. I mean, the one good thing is they've 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 gotten rid of the plan review, or no, they haven't gotten rid of the plan review, but they've 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 done this seismic upgrade two week streamline uh, review, which really does help with the cost of the carrying cost.
Do you guys have any more questions? Okay, guys. Well, we're probably going to get ready to wrap out. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming to the webinar. Um, uh, again, we're going to start. To, you'll look for the next um, webinar. Will be in just the beginning of G uh, January. We'll roll that out, um, and then also we will. Uh, oh, we, we'll be doing that market update in the middle of uh, uh, December as well. So hopefully, you guys are getting a, a lot of good things out of this. Uh, feel free to share it with all of your clients. And you guys, if you are not our clients, this comes all this experience and knowledge comes with our listing service. So, um, you know, if you're going to sell an investment property, call the guys that know how to sell investment properties. Um, um, oh, a couple more questions just kind of rolled in. Um, is there any liability of providing a pre-inspection to the seller? There is. Is there any liability providing pre-inspection to the seller? Oh, to the buyer. Um, no, there's no um, liability to the buyer because you're not guaranteeing the pre-inspection. You're just saying you did it for his own courtesy and for your own knowledge. Um, you know, the it, the only liability it would really probably fall on is if the broker who's representing that buyer says just use this pre-inspection. Because as a, a broker working with a buyer, you should be recommending three inspectors for the buyer to select from. Um, so, but no, I would not, uh, I, I don't think that that's uh, going to give you liability. Dale, yes, I will make sure your broker calls you. I think we talked about that last time. I'll make sure that happens. Okay, guys, any last questions? All right, well, I'm glad everyone got something out of this, and uh, we'll be doing more and more of these. Uh, you know, for the next 2019, we're really trying to help people with the, kind of the educational side. Um, again, you guys, we have a lot of experience, lost a lot of money doing this, made a lot of money doing this, but, you know, uh, we, what we're trying to teach people is just, you know, every little tips and tricks we can. I know we all need them. Uh, you know, daily, I'm always calling guys to ask for advice as well. So um, thank you again for, for uh, coming out. Uh, we're going to send you guys out a survey. Um, if you guys can fill that out, that really helps us so we know what to kind of plan the rest of our webinars for. We plan on doing this for the, all of 2019. So, um, again, uh, we'll do that market update. It's actually going to be on December 13th at noon, actually. And, they, uh, again, what that is going to go over is the 2018 wrap-up for the year and then what we're forecasting for 2019 and how we're purchasing those investments. So, um, thanks again, guys, and uh, hope have a good night.